I'm excited. Because next week we get almost a whole hour of that. I, I am excited. You don't have to hear me preach next week. You get more of them and less of me. So I'm excited about that. Uh, good morning. Good morning. And welcome this morning. Appreciate you being here. Those who are here in person, those who are worshiping with us online, we appreciate all of you being here. Uh, we have some announcements this morning. I am not going to cover them all. I just want to go on a couple of them. Uh, the first one is next Sunday, one worship service, 10 a.m. Uh, why are we having one worship service, Carol? We are doing our annual chancel choir Christmas cantata entitled Appalachian Winter. So it's really a beautiful retelling of Jesus' birth through music. I think you'll all enjoy it. Awesome. I am looking forward to that. Uh, a couple of th other things we need to cover. One is the poinsettia tree. Um, today uh, is the last day to uh, sign up to get a poinsettia in the, outside in the North X. There is a, uh, a sign-up sheet. Um, it's $8 uh, in memory of and um, honor of are the two ways you can do that. So if you'd like to do that, please do that by today so they can place the order uh, tomorrow. Um, other announcements that need to be made that I haven't made. There's a bunch of them in here. I advise you to take this with you. Uh, put it on your refrigerator, on your bathroom mirror, somewhere where you will see it and read it uh, daily so you'll know all that's going on. Uh, there's lots of events happening. It is the season of events. Um, I would ask you to be careful uh, over the next few weeks. We have a number of people in the church right now who have colds, the flu, COVID, strep throat. Um, I can go on. Uh, but that's just here in this church, so please be careful um, as you gather together. Um, please watch out if you're sick. Watch us online. Or worship with us online. If there's no, um, we, we, we'd appreciate that. Speaking of worshiping online, uh, we have a Facebook page that, that we use to advertise our events uh, to those who are on Facebook. If you were a member of Facebook, and if you would go to our uh, Rehoboth Young Methodist Church Facebook page and look at the events, if you would click share on the events so that your friends would see what's happening here, we would truly appreciate that. Now, let's uh, prepare our hearts to worship God today as our chancel choir leads us in our call to worship. Oh, I need one more announcement. First Thursday is this Thursday. It's hard to believe it's already a first Thursday again. We're, we're serving meals to community. It's one of the, the most incredible things we do for this community. I hear about it from the community. That's the one thing I hear from across the board is about first Thursday meals. It's this Thursday. Johnny, you could use some help, couldn't you? <laughs> Let me check my boy's schedule and I'll be there. So if you can help out on Wednesday or Thursday, please talk to Johnny. He could always use your help. Sorry about that. Stand and sing together. Come thou long expected Jesus. It's number 196 in the red hymn.
Friends, today we enter the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a season of anticipation, a season where we uh, anticipate, uh, we celebrate the, the first birth, the birth of Jesus Christ, his first coming, where we celebrate his continually coming into our lives, and we anticipate that he will once again, he will come again. And so each Sunday in Advent, we will light a candle um, to honor those gifts that God gives us. And today we light the candle of peace. Okay, the scripture for today is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. We light this candle to signify our hope for the Prince of Peace, whose birth we await in this Advent season, who brings peace not as the world gives, but true peace that passes all understanding. Let us pray. Lord God, we look to you to bring us true peace in a world where peace seems far away. We hear you call us to be peacemakers within ourselves and in the world around us, but we know we cannot find peace apart from your grace. Prince of Peace, we wait for you. Come, Lord Jesus, be born in our midst. Grant us peace in our hearts and lives. Amen. if you are sitting next to the center aisle or only person on your aisle, if you'd find the pew pad, if you'd fill that out for us and pass it along to your neighbor, let them fill it out as well. Um, we'd love to know that you're here. We'd love to know who's worshiping with us. Also in the, uh, in the, fr in the front of you uh, should be prayer request cards. If you have a prayer request or a praise, if you'd fill that out, um, after you're done filling that out, if you'd raise your hand, um, our usher will be glad to get, grab that from you and get it to me. Um, while we're doing that, let us um, sing together Away in the Manger. It's number 217.
go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we come to you today as your children, as your church. We come in faith. We come in hope. We come in peace. We come in joy. We come in love. Lord, we come. So very thankful for your very presence here, here in our lives, in this holy space. Lord, we come so very thankful that you love us unconditionally. We come, Lord, knowing that we've failed you, that we've broken our relationship with you over and over again, that we've disobeyed you, that we've pushed against you, that we've denied you. But Lord, we come confessing your son is Lord and Savior. We come claiming his life, his death, his resurrection. We come in faith. And so Lord, we know that Because of that faith, we are forgiven. And so we come in prayer. We come, Lord, thankful for your Son, thankful for your Holy Spirit, thankful that we can be here now to lift up to you our concerns, our desires. Lord, before me are cards with names, situations in our hearts our names and situations. Lord, you know each and every one of us. You know what's going on inside. You know the conflicts that are stopping us from being at peace. And so, Lord, we offer ourselves, our prayers into you. We know that you're the great physician, the great healer. We know, Lord God, that that you are God of God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. We know that your very presence can heal, can bring peace, can transform. And so, Lord, we ask, we ask for your presence in our lives and lives of those that we lift up. And Lord, right now in this world, there's so much going on, so much conflict, so much discord. We ask in this season of Advent, this season of celebration and anticipation, Lord God, that you would bring peace, that all may know your peace. And so, Lord, we ask that you would use us, your church, your children, to do just that. Let us be vessels of your peace in these coming days. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a hymn this morning. O little town of Bethlehem, it's number 230. Let's stand and sing together verses 1, 2, and 4.
Amen. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. <coughs> this time I'd like to ask our ushers to come down and receive our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you to worship you, and as an act of worship and an act of faith, we give back. We ask you to accept our offering, O Lord God, that you would accept it and that you would bless it, that you would anoint it and use it, Lord God, to see your kingdom grow, to see your holy word spread across this earth, to see your Son acknowledged as Lord and Savior by all. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verse 25 through 31. Uh, scripture takes place um, after the Last Supper and before Jesus' arrest. He's teaching his disciples. And in part, he says these words. I've said these things to you while I am still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you love me, you will rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I've told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. And rise, let us be on our way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Jesus' peace. Christ came as the Prince of Peace. One of his gifts to us was peace. As I think about this um, Advent season uh, leading up to Christmas and you can look and see, some of you can see the, the new banners, uh, the lovely banners we have. And if you can't, over on um, your right is a, a banner that portrays the, the nativity scene. It's Joseph and Mary, uh, the baby Jesus, and um, an animal or two. And, you know, we have this image, I think, in our heads, in our hearts of a, a peaceful night, that night of that first Christmas, um, that first Christmas morning being peaceful. Um, I've never understood why anyone thought that it was going to be peaceful. Let me give you a few examples of why it may not have been quite so peaceful. One, um, consider Mary. She was nine months pregnant, traveling from her hometown away from family and friends to a town she'd never been to probably before. She was unmarried and with child and was the scandal of her hometown. And she had told her boyfriend that the child was God's. And he'd looked at her like she was crazy. How peaceful do you think she truly was? How about Joseph? His girlfriend who said, said hey, Joe, I'm pregnant. I know we've never been together, but I'm pregnant. And you know what? It's God's. Can you imagine Joseph's reaction? Not just what he displayed outside, but what was going on in his head and his heart. Even after the dream, even after his encounter with, with the angel. I don't know about you, but I don't imagine there was a whole lot of peace. And then, and then he had to take Mary and travel from his hometown to Bethlehem to be registered for the census. He had to carry, bring his pregnant girlfriend on a road trip. Anybody ever been on a road trip with a pregnant woman? <laughs> it is not peaceful. <laughs> I promise you, it was not peaceful. You know, and then we have this image of the, of the road they were on. We have these, these beautiful paintings and drawings and images of, of Mary... Uh, riding on a donkey with Joseph leading the donkey and they're all by themselves on the road. No. Everybody had to go somewhere for the census. Everybody. Do you think Joseph was the only person in his family who took his girlfriend, his wife, 
and had to go to Bethlehem to the census? Everybody in his family was on that road. Everybody in his extended family. His aunts and uncles and cousins and brothers and sisters and everybody he knew was on that road going to Bethlehem. And only the ones that lived in his town, all the ones from all the other towns, all his extended family was on that road traveling to Bethlehem to be counted. Now, there was a scandal in his hometown because he was engaged to a woman who was very obviously pregnant. They had not gotten married yet. Do you think the rumors stayed home in their hometown? Or do you think that rumor mill traveled with them on the road to Bethlehem? Y'all know people, right? People were talking. Tongues were wagging. There was not peace on that road. It was crowded. Every time they stopped for the night, there was a scramble to find a a safe place to stay, a place to be, just a place to get on off the side of the road. And then they got to Bethlehem. The the Scripture says there was no room at the inn. It was crowded. There was no place for them. Can you imagine if everybody who had ever been raised and born in Terrell and all their descendants that are alive, everybody had, come back, had to come back to here, this little town of Terrell, this little community of Terrell, to be counted. Imagine if this church was the place everybody had to come to to be counted. Now imagine this, all your relatives, all your kinfolk, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth cousins, all their kinfolk, all of them, they came knocking on your door. Knock, knock, knock. Here we are. We're here to stay. There's no room at the inn. Can you keep us? Can you feed us? You think there was peace? Yet Jesus said, I come to give you peace. I bring that up because I don't believe Jesus came to a world at peace. We, we have this image of him coming at peace. The only peace there was at the time was the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And you know how Rome maintained a peace? An iron fist. An iron fist. If you rebelled, if you did something wrong, they squished you with might and violence. It was a forced peace. It wasn't an enjoyable peace. Anybody ever gone to a family reunion or a family holiday and, and you had a truce with somebody in your family? You agreed for mama's sake or grandma's sake that you weren't going to bring up all those issues that normally come up. You were going to be at peace with one another. But it really wasn't peace. It was just you didn't talk about what was going on. There was still anxiety. There was still that <clears throat> where you were just waiting for somebody to say the wrong thing. That's not real peace. That's just lack of conflict happening. Jesus came to bring peace to the world. Now, what kind of peace do you think Jesus came to bring? I, normally, we, we, we would define peace as lack of conflict, right? A, a, a lack of war, a lack of fighting, a lack of conflict. Maybe it was peace would be simply being still for just a moment but that's fleeting all those are fleeting Jesus meant something else by peace and and in the Old Testament we have the word shalom the word that's interpreted peace in the Bible in the Old Testament and shalom means wholeness everything as it should be everything complete no um, brokenness. And, and the vision we get of that is the very first chapters of the Bible. When God is walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that's shalom. Shalom is, is God and people and creation intertwined and working together in harmony. As, Paul, as uh, Neil Plantega says, the world as it should be. I want, you to image, I want you to imagine that. God, creator of all things, including us humans, walking in the garden even with human, Eden with humans. God walking beside you, God talking to you, God enjoying your very existence, enjoying the garden he created, his greatest 
um, beauties that he created, and, and you're there with God enjoying all this. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's ever been wrong. That's the image of what peace is in the Bible. And, 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 and for the Old Testament, for the Hebrews in the Old Testament, it was living in community where, where they were worshiping God, they were doing the, the commandments that God taught them, they were living by the commandments, they were worshiping God, they were loving God with all their heart, mind, soul, and they were in love with their neighbors, loving their neighbors as they loved themselves, and they were doing community as God wanted them to do community. Everything was right. There was no brokenness. No one had any conflict with someone else. That was what they were striving to achieve. Now, did they strive it? Did they achieve it? No. But, but when they spoke of, speak of shalom, they, they're speaking of wholeness in somebody's life. May you be whole. May you be completed. May you know who you are and whose you are. May you know your purpose in life. And may you find great joy in whose you are and your purpose in life. May you be whole and healthy and prosperous. That's the Old Testament understanding of shalom. And Jesus comes and he says to his disciples, I've come to give you peace, to give you shalom, to give you wholeness. Now, how do you think God comes to give us peace, to give us shalom, to give us that? Well, why did Christ come? Why did he, he came so that we could be in what? A right relationship with God. So we're broken. If you go back to that old, the Old Testament image in, in Genesis of God and the first humans, Adam and Eve, and the Garden of Eden, what happens there? Disobedience. Adam and Eve disobey God. They eat of the forbidden fruit. And there's conflict now between humans and God right? You have conflict. Humans said, oh, what? You know, we know better than you. You said not to do this, but we're going to do it anyway. That's conflict. Then what happens after God realizes they've sinned and he encounters them in the garden, hiding from him, wearing fig leaves, what's old Adam say right away? It's her fault. Conflict between Adam and Eve and God. And now there's conflict between Adam and Eve. Conflict between humans. And then because of the conflict, because of the sin of humans, God's cursed the earth. And now there's conflict between God and humans and creation. So we have conflict in this world. And the biggest conflict is our relationship with God, the human relationship with God. And, and, and Jesus saint came so that that conflict could be healed so that we could be made whole with God. He came so that we could have a right relationship with God. Through his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, we are given the opportunity to be in a whole relationship with God. And so he invites us. He says, I love you. And the Father loves you so much. God loves you so much he sent me. And so what we need to grasp, first of all, is that the way to be at peace is to understand that God loves us, and God loves us unconditionally. Now, that's hard for us to grasp, but that God loves us unconditionally because we've never truly known unconditional love. In the back of our mind, no matter how much somebody loves us, in the back of our mind, there's always that doubt. If I mess up, if I do something wrong, that person, our closest people, are not going to love us anymore. I don't care who we are, there's always that doubt that if we mess up, somehow, some way, somebody's not going to love us anymore. That's part of the sin nature in us, is that doubt. But let me tell you this right now, God loves you unconditionally. I know that because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world with no conditions on it. He sent him into the world with love because he loved us. He sent his son. He didn't say, I'm going to send my son, and I'll love you if you have faith in him. He says, no, I love you, so I'm sending my son. And so Jesus comes to restore that right relationship with God. And, and so if we will just have faith in God, trust that God loves us, that Jesus came 
out of love for God, and we will have faith upon the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, we can enter into our right relationship with God. And if, if we're right in a right relationship with God, we will find peace. And that's the beginning of the peace that Christ offers us. I want you to think about resting in God's embrace and how peaceful that would be. I want you to think about walking in the garden with God and having being at peace. And so God offers that opportunity for us to walk with God, to be in right relationship with God, to be in a loving relationship with God. And then God says, if you are in a right relationship with me, if, if you accept my love and you love me back and we're in a loving relationship, what's going to happen is my love is going to flow through you into the world. And so you will begin loving your neighbors. Imagine loving God and loving our neighbors, what kind of peace we'd be at. Imagine, just imagine for a moment, if all we do is if we're in love with God and we're in love with those closest to us. I mean, true love, love that's forgiving and grace-filled, love, love that holds no memory of wrongs in the past, just a, a love, an unconditional love, like love God gives us if we would offer unconditional love to those around us. Man, wouldn't we find the peace of Christ in that? In relationship with God? understanding God loves us, understand that we've been forgiven by God, that God holds nothing against us, that we have nothing to be ashamed of because God loves us and God forgives us and we're able to go to God with anything and everything. And then we're in relationship with those around us in a way where they also are loved by us, we're loved by them. It's a grace-filled relationship. Now, we'd be at peace, wouldn't we? Because the reason we're not at peace is because we're often at conflict and the, we begin with conflict in ourselves. My biggest problem isn't with any of you, it's with, with me. There, there are things in my life, in my head, that I think that, that cause me to be in conflict with God. And I can tell you that when I'm in conflict with God, when I don't go to God every morning, every noon, every afternoon, every evening in prayer, when I'm not trying to live in the will of God, I'm in the conflict with God my relationship with my wife suffers. Because if, if something's wrong between me and God, there's something wrong with every other aspect of my life. And, and we don't always realize that, but I'm telling you, if you have issues in your life, the first place you've got to check is how are you doing with God? Are you in the right relationship with God? Have you confessed your sins? Have you acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Are you loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And then from there, if you know that's right, then you can go, okay, where am I in conflict with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Where am I in conflict with those loved ones that are immediately around me? Have I confessed my sins? Have I apologized? Have I asked them for forgiveness? And you're going, well, Tony, what are you talking about? How, how, where's that? Well, we do something every Sunday in this church, in these services, that's biblical, and we do it for just that purpose, so that if we are right with God, but we're in conflict with one another, we have an opportunity to make it right. And it comes from Paul's teaching about Holy Communion. One of the things Paul said about Holy Communion was, don't go to the table and eat of the Holy Meal if you have something against your brother or your sister. He says, go to them and make it right before you partake of the meal. And so in church services, we do something that came about because of that. What's that? That's that greeting one another in Christ. What I say to you each Sunday is greet one another in the love and peace of Jesus Christ. And that's our opportunity to go to one another and if there's conflict to mend that conflict. And that's what we're supposed to do as people who are in love with God, who are in love with neighbor, is to make sure our relationship is right with God and our relationship is right with each other. And then we can truly begin to be at peace. And then the third part of that is being at peace with not only with God, not only with each other, but also being at peace with God's creation around us. Because shalom is the webbing together of God, people, and God's creation. I want you to think about that. In the beginning was God. In the beginning, God created creation. 
and then humans and set humans to be in relationship not only with God, but creation because we were told to tend it. And so for us to truly be at peace, we need to be at peace with God, with each other, and creation. And so if our lives are not being at peace, if our inner lives are not at peace, why? Well, you know, we need to figure that out because if our inner lives are not at peace, our public lives are not going to be at peace. I can promise you if I'm not at peace with God, my relationship with my wife struggles. It does. It's just I don't recognize that's the problem, but I can tell you it is. And if, if my relationship with God and my wife are in conflict, you're going to pay the price for that. I'm not going to be a good preacher. I'm not going to be a good friend to be around. And so we need to understand that the, what Christ comes to offer us peace, and we need to seek it. It needs to be something we're intentional about. We need to seek Christ's peace. I know people who love chaos. You might know people who just seem to relish chaos. I can't stand that. I, I want peace. I, I really do. And, and so what we need to do is we need to seek peace. And it's not of our own making. It's a gift from Christ. He came to give us his peace. But how we do that is we, we go to God and say, Lord, I've tried. Not, I've failed. So I, I'm going to accept it from you now. And, and Christ said something incredible when he was talking to his disciples. In, in saying, I give you my peace, he followed up by saying, I'm giving you my Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's coming. And so for us, we receive peace by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, by, by falling in love with God, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then God's love allows us to love our neighbors. And then in loving God and loving neighbors, we're then able to go into the world and do God's will, the Great Commission, tend to the world, his whole creation, people and places, things. And then, and then we can find peace. And then if we're at peace, those around us begin to experience our peace. And they also begin to seek the peace of Christ. And it builds from there. And it builds from there. And so we are to be a people who seek knowing to get peace from God, to be at peace with God, but also to be peacemakers, to people who bring peace into the world. So as brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're causing conflict at any time, any place, we're not doing God's will. Now, I'm not saying you can't disagree but you need to find a way to be at peace with disagreement. I'm not saying that there can't be a time where you're doing one thing and somebody's doing something else, but how do you find a peace in that? You know, the church has done that for thousands of years. There's different personalities at churches, different denominations, um, and we can be at peace with someone who disagrees with us. We can be in love with God and in love with them without being in total agreement we just need to be at peace with God for that to happen. And then God gave us this meal. He gave us this spiritual feast, which, is a spiritual, which gives us spiritual power to do just that. We're not left alone. We're not left to be at peace of our own accord. We're not left to do it of our own power. We're not left to find peace by ourselves and go search it out. We are given a spiritually empowered meal that allows us to find ourselves in God's presence, eating at a table all together in love. One of my great enjoyments in life is sitting around a table and enjoying a good meal with good people. Anybody else ever enjoy that? Eating a good meal with good people? good conversation, you know, just, just good. To me, there's nothing better than that. And that's what we get to do today. We get to come in peace knowing that we will have confessed our sins and, and we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and we can be one and whole with God. We can be in love with God, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we can know that, that we've been given an opportunity to make peace with others. And we can come to this meal and we can sit around the table and that's, the, that's what we do. We come and partake of this meal and we go back to our pews and, 
And we sit there and we pray. We're, we're enjoying this meal together and to be at peace. We can be at peace because Christ came and, and God loved us so much that he gave his son for us out of love, unconditional love. His body was broken for us. And he came and he gave his blood. His blood was shed. It, it, it covers our sin. We no longer have to feel guilty or ashamed. We no longer have to worry about our actions. They've been forgiven by God. They've been washed clean. And so we don't have to come to God or we don't have to run from God as Adam and Eve. We don't have to hide from God. We can actually come to God. We can actually go to God and say, Lord, thank you for your love. I'm here. Broken as I am, I'm here. And God's love will fill us. And so as we come to the meal today, as you come to receive this gift from God, I I want you to receive God's love and God's peace. Know that the Holy Spirit is in this meal. And the Holy Spirit is in you, every believer. And God wants you to have and accept his peace. But we, like a present at Christmas morning, what good does a present under the Christmas tree do for you? Don't you hate presents under the tree that you never open? Anybody remember as a kid having a present somebody sent you in the mail and mom and dad wouldn't let you open it until Christmas morning? That present did you no good. It was all anxiety, wanting to know what was in it. On Christmas morning, you open the gifts and you enjoy it. And that's what we need to do with God's gift of peace. We need to accept it. And utilize it. So all you have to do is submit to God's love, accept God's peace, and then live it out, knowing that God is always with us. God will never allow you to go through things alone. You don't have to worry about all the stuff that's in your life that you're by yourself, and you've got to figure it out. You can release all that anxiety. You can release all the conflict in your life and hand it over to God and be at peace. And right now, some of you are saying, I've tried, I can't do it. Well, I'm telling you that through prayer and through partaking of this holy meal and being empowered by the Holy Spirit, you can do it. If you would turn to page 12 in the hymnal. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you, Lord, gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Jesus commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Holy Father, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. And Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at his banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray as our, your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kim, if you'll come. Friends, today as we, we partake of Holy Communion, I recognize we do it a little differently now with me here than we have in the past. We do it once a month now. I've tried to increase the number of times we take Holy Communion. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, beginning in the front, if you'll just come to the middle, form one one line down the middle. Um, Kim and I will be in the front. Um, I'll I'll stand before you. I'm going to take a piece of bread. I'm going to hold it up and say, the body of Christ broken for you. And then I'm going to hand it to you. If you'll come with open hands and take it. And if you'll take one of the little cups that, that Kim will be holding, and she'll say to you, the blood of Christ shed for you. You take it, partake of it. You can place your cup back in the little holes in the, in the kneeling rail. If you want to kneel and pray, you can kneel there. Or I invite you to go back to your seats, to your pew, and pray there while the others partake. Um, Kim, I'll serve you first. Table's been set. Oh. I'm used to the choir just coming <laughs> and getting ready. I'm sorry. But the table has been set. And you all are invited to come and protect. The choir is going to fill in first. They'll go back to the choir loft. And then, as you can, you come down the middle. And you
Is anyone who wasn't able to come up that we need to come to you to give you holy communion? Let us pray. Most gracious God, thank you for this meal and for your peace. In Jesus' name and through the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together Silent Night, Holy Night, number 239.
sorry we read late. I promise you I wrote a six-minute sermon taking into account Holy Communion and the lighting of the candles, but I stepped away from the sermon, and all the stuff I cut out, I put back in. So I apologize. (laughs) Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. May God be gracious to you, show you divine favor, and give you the peace of Christ. Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.